There is something in the river calling my name, and I am going to answer. Before I tell you what I'm about to tell you, you need to understand two things. First, I do not know how to swim. When you live in the place I do, it's more or less a useless skill. I mean, the deepest water around is up to my shoulders at best. Can you really blame me? I can't say where I'm from for obvious reasons, but just know that most of it is a very arid, very empty desert with a whole lot of nothingness. Water is life here, and it's evident in that if you stray too far off the beaten path and away from water, you will get lost and you'll be lucky if anyone sees you again before sundown. My village is settled neatly between two gentle rolling mesas, and along a thin river in a sparsely populated community, lovingly called the Valley. This place is old. Very, very old. The kind of old that you can feel setting in your bones when you walk along the same dirt roads that have been used for a few hundred years. Most of the community has been here since before America was even a thing, and definitely much before we became a part of it. Save for a few transplants that descend from the city to retire, everyone is family. Even if, all in all, we are far and few between. The nearest big city of a few thousand is an hour away. But that leads me to the second thing you need to know. I loved Isabella. A lot. We were sister cousins. She was my mom's sister's kid, my cousin. But we grew up close enough to be sisters. It may sound weird if you are not from a family like mine, or a community as tight-knit as ours, but we were always together. Because of how condensed our village is, we were also neighbors, classmates, and altar girls at church together. I saw her more than my own parents, and it was the same for her. She was two months older than me, and always seemed to hold that fact over my head as some sort of superiority thing. Whatever. But we were close. We fought a lot, like real sisters, and she could be the snootiest brat ever if given the opportunity. But I loved her then, and I still do. We did everything together. School, catechism, sleepovers, meals. For how much we butted heads, you'd think we wouldn't want to spend so much time together. But it was the opposite. That was our love. But by far, our favorite thing to do together was visiting the river. Beyond the bend of the fields and right down the road from our grandmothers, you could find the heart of the river, the place where it was its widest. The river itself is shallow most of the year, up to my hips everywhere except for the heart. There, it almost got up to my neck. Even better, right at the mouth of it was a gentle rolling waterfall that was smooth and eroded enough to go down, kind of like some sort of natural water slide. It was so overgrown with moss that it was pretty comfortable, and we'd race each other as we slid down. I always won as the stockier one, obviously. The river used to be much deeper, apparently, by around 10 to 15 feet, if what every old person in my life has claimed is true. 
but it's still fun. As young kids, it was kind of the local youth hangout spot. Any summer day we went, there was guaranteed to be at the least a few other kids running around in ragtag hand-me-down shorts on its shores. And we'd all play together, share some sodas, and then walk each other home. It was awesome! It's relatively safe in the daytime here, so we'd never need permission or someone to watch us. But as we got older, fewer and fewer people came, and now it's rare to see even a single person there. Maybe that's for the best. But back then, when it was just me and Bella, we'd have so much fun. We'd swim until we were tired and our fingers had pruned up like raisins. And then we'd lounge out on the shore and enjoy the warmth of the sun. From sunrise to sunset, we'd spend all of our time there, eating bologna sandwiches my mom packed us, and talking about life. Who was dating who, how annoying our other siblings were, what the future had in store for us. It was great. And basically every time, we'd dare each other to swim over the hole as it was ominously called. The hole was the deepest part of the river, right beneath the edge of the waterfall, where the water curled and formed a tiny whirlpool. The hole itself was only wide enough to reasonably fit a slim adult, and its depth was unknown. The rock underfoot surrounding it would immediately drop off into a very cold, dark, nothingness. We joke that it went to the center of the earth, and we try so hard to go to the bottom. We never did. I think that no one ever will. And I can only pray for whoever tries. But back then, we'd always attempt it. This is where that part about me not knowing how to swim is important. See, we'd always dare each other to swim over the top of it and drop down as far as we could before we had to come up for air. And I always won because I always cheated. I'd take a comically big breath and do some obnoxious underwater squat to make it seem like I had really gone down, would even flail my arms and let my breath escape as bubbles for dramatic effect so it was believable. Isabella was none the wiser. It wasn't like I could have admitted that I couldn't swim. It would have been just another thing she'd hold over my head as the inferior sister. Yet she'd try her best, but never got farther than me. Until the time she actually did. I'll come back to that. Maybe she also didn't know how to swim and cheated too and was somehow worse at doing that than me. Or maybe she just really sucked at swimming. It doesn't matter. And after, after the sun had started to dip under the horizon and the mosquitoes started to get nasty, we'd share a towel, because she always forgot hers, and walk down the road to our grandma's. She was a much older lady and didn't speak much English, but she was the most comfortable person I've had in my life. She'd chastise us for being out with wet hair when the temperature was dropping so suddenly with the onset of dusk, and ushered us into the shower and curl up around the wood stove. By the time we were all clean and in comfortable clothes, she'd have hot cocoa ready on the stove for us. We'd warm up with a cup 
And because Grandma didn't have a TV, she'd tell us stories to fall asleep to until our parents came for us. She had the best stories, and despite the language barrier, they were enthralling. Most of them were scary, I won't lie. Crying ghosts of dead mothers treading the river shore, unspeakable monsters waiting in the abandoned mines on the mesas, of the old man with the black hat that would wait outside your window if you stayed up too late. They were intended to be lessons, I know that now, but she would spin them so creatively. I wish I could remember them as vividly as she told them, because maybe if I had, Isabella would still be here. The most important one was of the big, great monster beneath the river. I'd brag about beating Bella in our foe competition in the hole, and she'd just frown this deep, unhappy, old lady frown, and sigh with the weight of decades upon decades. Don't mess around in that river, Mia. Nothing good down there. She'd tell us that you couldn't swim over it if you were one of three things. A very young child, a pregnant woman, or if you were menstruating. All very strange conditions. Because evidently, there was something deep and bad and terrible in the hole, and it fed on the young. Because a very long time ago, back when the world was all animals and spirits, Coyote had stolen the beast's young, and now it needed to feed in revenge. When I was a little older, she'd add on to it, talking about how her mother warned her about it when she was a little girl, because one day, while pregnant, she had slipped while waiting during the dry season and fallen into the hole. And the very next day, the baby was gone. Just like that. I asked my mom once, and she chalked it up to grandma remembering a miscarriage her mother had, weirdly, on account of her age. It sounded plausible, but now, I think Grandma was right. When it happened, we'd been older. It was a year ago, almost to the date. Grandma had passed three years before. We hadn't seen each other in nearly two years because of the pandemic and us moving away for school. Isabella and I went to the river, the same as we did every summer, though less frequently than we had in years past. If the old people had complained about the river's depth before, they would have been miserable with it then. It was the shallowest it had been in my entire life, hardly up to my thighs in the thick of it. The stream was light, practically stagnant, and the waterfall was but a slow trickle, threatening to dry up altogether. This place had been in a drought since long before my time, but never had it been so bad. Usually, there was a brief flood period every spring that would leave the river full enough to not dry out before winter. Not this time. The river was suddenly a ghost of what it once was. Shallow and still and devoid of any local life like it used to have. It was quiet, unnaturally so, with nothing but the singing of cicadas and the soft bubbling of the river to fill the void. The community as a whole had been getting smaller and smaller 
with every passing year, and the river was truly symbolic of that. Bella and I still made it work. We rolled out our towels and tanned, splashed around a bit, and ate the same bologna sandwiches we'd been having since we were kids. And then, she reminded me, Hey, remember that game we'd play with the hole? I shrugged. Sure, the one you always lost at? The comment earned a punch to the shoulder, but she still laughed and nodded in its direction. Wanna try? For old time's sake? Of course I said yes, and between giggling and trying to shove each other into the shallow, murky water, we waded over to the usual spot. Even with kicked up sand and stagnant water, it still stood out like an inky black portal hiding all of its secrets beneath the surface. I still didn't know how to swim, and the water was too shallow for me to cheat and squat like I'd always done. So I suggested she go first. Oh? Scared you're going to lose? Was all she said before pinching her nose and dropping in. It was the last thing she'd ever say to me. I really had expected her to comically sink down to just her chin and laugh, proving for once and for all that the hole was not, in fact, bottomless and had just seemed like it was so because of our lack of depth perception and childhood fantasy. But she didn't. No, she slipped right beneath the surface of the water without so much as making a ripple. It was quiet, painfully, unnaturally quiet. Several seconds passed, and then a minute. Bella? I called. You made your point. You can come up now. Nothing. I started to panic. Really, really panic. I still couldn't swim, but I was scared. So I did the best thing I could think of. I crawled closer, sat on its edge, and for the first time ever, actually dipped my entire leg beneath its rim and into the ice-cold abyss beneath. I tried to squint and see, but the light flesh of my leg disappeared in its depths. And if it wasn't for the chills racking my body from the sheer cold of it, I might have worried about it disappearing too. I tried to feel her out, but nothing. I'd reached at least three feet down and there was nothing but ragged, tight stone walls to scrape my toes against. My heart dropped and I started to breathe harder, desperately shouting her name and trying to reach deeper. I could feel a light tug, like some sort of suction, a force pulling me down, deeper almost. It had always been there. As a kid, it had somehow felt stronger, but now it acted as a mere suggestion. Come down a little more. It was like some inaudible voice had whispered. And then there was a hand grabbing my ankle tight enough to hurt, icy and firm. I screamed and struggled to stand up, desperate to get away. And as I pulled my leg up and away from the hole, so with it came... Isabella. As soon as I recognized her, I grabbed her from the water and pulled her up, crying and sobbing out apologies. At first, she seemed fine, just looking around dazed with glossy eyes and this sullen-like expression. I held her face and kept repeating her name, but it was like she couldn't focus. And then she coughed, dark, murky water spilling from her lips, 
and it kept and kept until I was sure she was going to choke. It stopped. But there Isabella was, now twenty pounds lighter and violently shaking. She fell over, and that was when I noticed. The skin of her feet was gone. All of it scraped away like she'd been the victim of some bad accident, leaving twitching, throbbing muscle and tendon beneath. Bone peeked out, and that was when I saw it. Little pox, where the red-stained bone was, marring it unnaturally. Teeth marks, something had been gnawing on her. The rest was a blur. At some point, I called the police to send an ambulance, but if you know how inaccessible rural communities are, you know how long it takes. Thirty goddamn minutes spent holding my shaking, catatonic sister on the same shore we'd safely played on for years before. They came. Not soon enough. But they came, and I had to watch as she was wheeled away. It would be the healthiest I'd see her for the rest of her short life. She died five days later from severe dehydration and organ failure. Ironic, right? In her last days, Isabella was manic, scared, and so utterly violent, she had to be restrained and sedated. She'd stopped speaking in any recognizable way, and her eyes stayed unfocused and glossy till the very end. I visited her as soon as I could, but she'd already been too far gone, not recognizing me for more than a few seconds before shrieking. I only knew about the rest of it after talking to her parents my aunt and my uncle. Bella had developed hydrophobia, a real, visceral aversion to water. She couldn't be bathed, and refused water to the point that they had to give her an IV, which she promptly pulled out, only to see her own blood and make the connection that that, too, was water before completely mutilating herself with just her fingernails in an attempt to remove it. She'd been restrained and sedated after that, until she took her last breath. The next day, it flooded worse than it had in years. The most reasonable conclusion they could come up with was that she'd somehow contracted rabies, or some sort of brain-eating amoeba months before, and that it had started to truly manifest after she'd scraped her feet while diving. They wanted to run an autopsy to test her brain, but if they did, I don't know. My aunt and uncle moved away a few weeks after her passing, and our village is lonelier than ever now. Everyone was willing to pass it off as some freak accident, but I couldn't. I dreamt of my sweet Bella a lot, of her cold, lifeless, sunken eyes that had bore into me in the days before she died. I know that some thing did this to her. That chill in that hole was unnatural, unearthly, a sharp, painful contrast to the otherwise sun-warmed river, like it wasn't even water down there, but something else, something thinner and sinking. 
it's been calling to me. Literally. I'd been taking the dogs out for a bathroom break one evening about a month ago, and I'd heard it. Splashing. And a lot of it. From the ditch situated between the road and our house. We get beavers in them sometimes, so I'd trudged over to look, only to find that the ditch was empty. Not just of beavers, but of water, too. I had forgotten that they'd shut them off because of the drought. I tried my best to move past it, but I kept hearing it. That horribly familiar splashing, like flailing arms trying to climb out of that hole every goddamn night. I had remembered our grandma's story and cursed myself for not having her around to ask about it now. So I did the next best thing and looked at the local census. I pulled several all-nighters poring over them, every document written and published for our village over the past several hundred years, just looking and searching for some sort of answer. Until finally, it happened. I saw the pattern. Every few years in this place, there were accounts of it. Of little kids and babies disappearing into the river. And after every bout of them, there was a flood and intense summer rains like clockwork. All the way until the past fifty years. Suddenly, Fewer and fewer kids died, just because there weren't as many around. As we slowly depopulated, just from folks moving away, there were less people and less kids. I'd noticed it in my lifetime, too. How there were half as many now as there were when I was that age. I didn't get it at first. But now, I do. Shortly after my realization, the river started calling my name. It would start as odd, garbled sounds that were hardly recognizable, until eventually, it was a full-blown whisper in some horrible, wretched tongue I'd never been witness to. Cass. It would whisper and cry every single night, an alluring noise that pulled me to seek out that dark, damp hole again. I felt like I was going crazy. Maybe I was grief-stricken and losing my shit after months of trying to heal. That's what I thought. I had to make a mistake to eventually realize the truth. I fucked up, but I get it. It took me venturing to that godforsaken place again. I was upset, and not in my right mind, still mourning Bella's absence in my life after I came home for the summer, and it wasn't the same. And so, in a fit of hysterics, I stood over that inky black hole in the middle of one lazy, overbearing afternoon, and I stepped in. I'm sure Bella was looking up at me from the afterlife, cursing me for being stupid enough to follow her, but I had to, and I know now. I slipped under the surface, and there was that force slowly dragging me down and consuming me in an instant. I don't know how long I was down there. It couldn't have been long. I didn't drown, after all. I was pulled impossibly deep. Deep beneath the hole and rock and slate to some forbidden place that none should speak of. It felt like just a moment, but it was long enough to feel it. It doesn't have a name I can say, 
There aren't words to really describe it as more than a feeling. But it is a thing. An ancient, hungry thing. I felt its presence like a bad omen, and I instantly knew of what it was. It is a being far, far older than me, than Grandma, and the village, and maybe even the mountains. It speaks in some sort of universal language that I could never reciprocate, even if I tried. And in it, it whispered its name. I'll never forget that sound, clear as a bell, even within the deep, murky waters. And then, it started to eat, and I realized it fed, and it fed on young blood. This thing, be it god or demon or something older than either of those things, was ravenous. And tied to its hunger was the very waters that served as the lifeblood of my home. In an instant, a history of the land flashed through my brain. It had been known before when humankind first settled here and sought its benevolence. If you take care of me, I will take care of you. All those kids, all those babies, grandma's mother, the sudden drought, it all made sense. And before I could even comprehend it, that thing spit me out, seemingly disgusted by my aged flesh and blood. Not all the way, because I had to claw my way up, up and through that claustrophobic hole until I could breathe again. When I pushed out of the water, my skin had gone white from the cold and blood loss. I fainted after that. I woke up hours later in a sterile, painfully white hospital room to my mother sobbing over me and the doctor trying to explain to my half-conscious form what had happened. I was told I was lucky I was found when I was, after some fishermen had stumbled upon me and sped to the ER. And then the bad news. My entire left foot and three of my toes had been taken. It was a shock. It didn't feel real. It still doesn't. I get phantom pains where those parts of me should be, forgetting until I try to stand up and fall over. I was closely monitored, especially after what happened to Bella. And for a while, I truly did think I was going to die the same way she had. Every time anyone spoke, it was like I was trying to understand them from three feet underwater. I swear I could only think in that awful, evil language I'd heard. And then it started. The hydrophobia. It's hard for me to rationally explain. The first time, a nurse had tried bringing me a cup of water, and I'd instinctively screamed, No! and swatted it away. And then I couldn't drink anything. Couldn't bathe without screaming myself unconscious. And I couldn't even think of water without breaking into a cold sweat. Until I didn't have enough water in my body to even do that. It hurt. I was convinced this was it. I had an innate fear of water and now I was going to slowly dehydrate to death. Just like Bella. 
and just like her, it rained the entire week after. I think that I might have just been over the cusp of being too old for that thing to devour. Isabella had been a year younger than me when it bit her, and though we both developed the sickness, I got better, because after three days, words started being coherent again, and I was slowly able to reintroduce myself to water. Or maybe, it chose me for a reason. To this day, I try to touch water less, even now, because when I touch it, or drink it, I can feel it thrumming deep beneath the ground in this massive underground lake where it calls to me. I shower far less than I probably should, and only drink water when absolutely necessary. I've made life bearable by keeping myself on the brink of dehydration constantly. It sounds horrible, and I've heard the hushed rumors going around about how unsightly I've become, but I don't care. Because it whispers my name every night, calls for me to come down and venture into its depths. It's got a job for me, and I'm scared. I'm scared because I have a choice to make. After my venture in, it rained so good and hard for the first time in weeks that, for the first time in a while, the whole valley was flush and lively. I don't think I had seen it like that since I was very little and we still had a monsoon season. I've seen what it does now. Even a taste of my spoiled, old blood was enough for a feat like that. And even the river rose higher. It was a display, a promise. About a week ago, a new family moved in. They aren't from here at all, and in a familiar, closed-minded fashion, my community probably won't take to them. We don't like outsiders. They have kids. Lots of them. I've seen them. They live across from my grandma's old house. Sometimes they play in the river, wading around obliviously, too tall to swim in its shallow waters, totally unaware of the monstrosity on the other side. I know it's horrible, but I could tell them about the game me and Bella used to play, because maybe, just maybe, if it gets young blood after so long, things will get better. I know it's awful, and that I am a horrible person. I'd never felt attached to this place before. Not really. Not until it bit me, and my eyes were opened. It is an ancient, awful being. I know that. But the future is uncertain. And I'm scared. I'm scared, not because of the beast beneath the waves, but of loss. My community shrinks every day, and people like this would never be accepted here anyways. And besides, those people aren't good parents. They have so many kids, I'm sure they wouldn't notice or care if just one went away. If if you knew how special my home was, you'd probably do the same. Or maybe that's just it influencing me from afar. Isabella and Grandma would be so disappointed, but I don't think they'd get it. 
we could restore our little oasis to what it once was. Or even better, back to the way the old folks talk about how it was, with green, fertile pastures and opportunity and a thriving, bottomless river so deep that the danger within is long, long forgotten, out of sight, at least for a few decades. I'm a horrible person, but I know what I need to do. I'm sorry, Bella, but sometimes evil is a necessity for survival. I miss you so goddamn much, but even your sacrifice wasn't in vain. Our god has called me to worship, and I know nothing else anymore. I just hope you can understand. Hello, I'm Bees, and I, I'm astounded. There are over 100 of you, 123 to be exact, that have taken the time out of their days to not only watch and listen to my videos, but have subscribed as well. Some have even commented, I'd like you to know that I read them all. I really appreciate it. This feels amazing. I've always wanted to start a narration channel, specifically Creepypasta, and thanks to you and the authors who have supported me through their art, I can. So I'm very, very thankful to all who have subscribed, as well as to the various authors who have allowed me to use their work on my channel. Thank you. I'd like to give a very special shout out to three authors in particular who have allowed me to use multiple of their art. Cindy Costa, aka CGA Costa, on her Substack. User Psyoptic Nerve, who posts stories on their Reddit. And Michael Kelso, aka Horror Writer 1717, whose book is currently out on Amazon. As well as a shout out to Matthew Ortiz for being the 123rd subscriber. I've always considered many patterns of sequence that pop up in life to be lucky, so I hope it brings you all luck as well. I'm still reeling at the fact that over 100 of you listen. It's incredibly encouraging, so thank you. I am excited to share with you the stories and videos to come.